report of the Chief Executive, which is at page 61. And I'll hand over to Carlene. Um, thank you for that. Um, there are just a couple of things I wanted to uh, speak to. Um, one of which is uh, that given that we've had at least 35 separate media inquiries in the past seven working days um, around the regulatory compliance unit, I just want to talk to you a little bit about... Excuse um, me, sorry, I, I can't... Yeah, it is a bit... It's, um, it's not very loud. It needs to be turned up. Sorry. Maybe you can sing it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, 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 yeah, maybe that's just going to have to be a bit closer. All right, yeah. I'll lean forward. Um, uh, given that in the last seven days we've had at least 35 separate media inquiries around the regulatory compliance uh, unit's work, um, I just thought, and, the, and given that you've asked me some questions about that, I just thought I'd talk a little bit about the work that they do and how they actually um, uh, work across these issues. So just in terms of the scope, um, uh, the, the scope of the unit is really wide and varied, um, and it manages the majority of compliance and enforcement functions undertaken by the council. So that includes things such as animal management, parking compliance, environmental compliance, including things such as noise, con land contamination, asbestos, water quality, nuisance complaints, hazardous substances, alcohol licensing, uh, and health licensing such as food premises. Uh, but there's also other compliances such as brothels, swimming pools, quarries, resource consent monitoring. So, so a huge scope in terms of the work that they do. Um, and uh, just in terms of uh, the sort of um, the amount of work that they have, in terms of their uh, number of complaints in the 2013-2014 uh, figures, uh, take dog complaints for instance. So they had 12, around 12,800 dog nuisance complaints, so that includes things like dog attacks, unregistered dogs, license investigations and impounding, just as examples. Um, which was actually a 6% increase over the previous year, but a 1% decrease in high priority cases. Um, but more uh, the increase was around things such as barking, stray dogs or fouling dogs, which are around about 50% of the complaints. So a lot of those um, medium level uh, complaints um, and slight increase in that area. Um, they also deal with things such as nuisance complaints such as pests, odours, drugs, uh, sorry, dust, hazardous substances, uh, which actually de slightly decreased on the previous year. Noise complaints, um, they continue to be a significant activity uh, for the unit. Um, so in that 2013-2014 year, um, about 12,500 complaints over uh, the year, the majority of which are related to radios, stereos and TVs, about 9,500 to give you that uh, um, uh, level of service. Um, and there's been some decrease in that because uh, of the way that they deal with those. Um, and in the 13-14 year there were 58 seizures of noise equipment. So in terms of how the unit works, um, it really works within the best practice regulatory framework um, and has done so for a number of years around non-compliance. They use what they call the VAID model, V-A-D-E. Um, it's well recognised and utilised by a wide variety of regulatory agencies. And VAID stands for Voluntary, Assisted, Directed and Enforced, depending on the level or degree of non-compliance. Uh, in addition to that, the Council has to meet the thresholds defined by the Solicitor General's guidelines uh, for prosecution, which are around eviden evidential su sufficiency. So that's about having sufficient and credible evidence, um, enough for a prosecution and also public interest factors. Uh, and so the actions then range from education, infringement notices, abatement notices, and prosecution. So there's a range of things that they do. They work quite um, uh, proactively in terms of trying to prevent issues uh, and deal with issues early where they can. But in general, staff also use tools such as mapping of hotspots um, uh, so they can t understand where and why various complaints um, are and where they're aggregated and where to target their resources. So whilst it's not perfect, um, the, the process the team, uh, the team is really committed to providing a sort of um, professional service um, as well as having a continuous improvement process um, in terms of looking at everything that they do and how to learn from things such as the recent events and look at how they improve the way that they respond to that. <coughs> Excuse me. They also benchmark themselves against other territorial authorities um, and their regulatory processes and approaches 
um, are considered in that, not to mention that they collaborate uh, with other regulatory agencies to solve some of the wider issues. So as mentioned earlier, uh, whilst uh, we may not monitor some things, we may have to deal with the issues, and so we need to work with other agencies around that. So just an example is the, um, the team's looking at process improvements for long-term noise matters, um, and uh, they're currently uh, reviewing the use of infringement and abatement notices for these sorts of issues, and making changes to the reporting systems uh, so that it's more easy to facilitate identification and tracking of those sort of problem properties. Uh, and there's also been discussion in recent days with our after-hours contractors to ensure that our long-term plan KPIs uh, will be met within the standard that we require. So constantly looking at the issues and trying to improve our responses to those things uh, is part of everything that they do. Just a couple of other issues I want to touch on. Um, so our People and Culture Committees met several times in the last year, um, working on priority areas outlined by staff around two key themes. Um, that uh, have been established by staff. Uh, one about uh, developing a culture of service to the customer, whether internal or external, um, and also internally about the way that we work together, making sure that that's a better process in terms of um, how we work across um, the various areas within the organisation. And in those areas, the strategies around uh, leadership capability, making the council more accessible to the community and empowering people to make decisions are some of the three areas that they really want to focus on initially. And just in that vein, um, uh, the executive leadership team has just launched a significant internal program across the organisation that's really aimed at refocusing the council to being much more externally and customer focused, uh, being more efficient and continually looking at how we can improve the way that we deliver our services both internally um, and externally. And the real value uh, will, that will, will be in the things that we see that change in the way that people um, uh, interact with the council and the council services and the benefit that they get from those. So I'll update you regularly in this report on how that's progressing. Thank you. Um, Paul. Just a couple of questions, uh, one in relation to the capital expenditure, and we've got a, uh, a estimated uh, underspend of $392 million. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to know um, if we continue that sort of pattern of underspend. I know, I know there's a, an anomaly there with the Sumner Roadworks, but if we continue on the anomaly of this uh, underspend going forward, how does that affect the, uh, the pinch point of our um, financial shortfall in, in uh, the years to come? The second question I have is just around the... Um, uh, rates and the uh, the debit forms. Mm -hmm. um, do we send those debit forms out with the rating bills so we can actually encourage these people to get uh, themselves onto that direct debit? I'll start with that first. So we have, a, I think, a 35% direct debit, uh, which we'd like to see higher. Um, so there was initially some advertising of that, but now indeed there's a, a notice that goes out with the rates that say that you can do that. Um, provide it um, through a direct debit. Uh, in terms of the um, capital, that's an area that we're looking at in terms of how we improve our end-to-end -end process so that we don't uh, over-promise and under-deliver. Um, there are some issues in terms of uh, specific areas that um, are in the capital plan. I think Sumner Road's in there that contribute significantly to that. Um, in terms of uh, pinch points, in terms of our financial strategy, I might have to hand over to our Chief Financial Officer. So with respect to the, the long-term plan, we'll be uh, providing estimates and assumptions within the long-term plan of carry forward and capital expenditure. So that'll be clear within the long-term plan as to how it flows through and where the pinch points are. Because um, as well as any particular carry forwards from this year or, or next year, uh, the underlying capital expenditure is also obviously um, taken into account to asset ascertain where the net debt to revenue is going to flow throughout the entire um, 10 and even 30 years and beyond. Thank you. Dani and then Jamie. Um, thank you. I have several questions. Um, I just wanted to check on just on page 63. Um, I note that we have received 2.5 million from Sarah, their contribution to district plan costs. Is that 50% of our costs? My understanding was that they were going to... 50-50 um, split, but that seems low. Uh, the, the agreement, um, as I understand it, is that uh, it was 50% uh, of the 5 million that was budgeted, 
uh, and then there would be a discussion of anything over and above that. Right, okay. Um, the Sumner Road corridor, which is 110 million, uh, obviously being carried forward, but is that scheduled to be progressed now? And what's the time frame? But has it, has it all been agreed that it will go ahead? Um, no, uh, I'll again hand over to Dave Adamson. Um, uh, I think there are still some discussions going on. Sumner Road? Sorry, David, you've been caught on the hop, <laughs> so okay. um, the, just an update on the um, timetable for Sumner Road. Road. Uh, for people that don't speak, um, you know, sort of that language, <laughs> Horizontal <laughs> Infrastructure <laughs> Governance Group, yep. <laughs> and so that should give me approval. The work will take three years to do because of the benching, yep. we are hoping to get up there this season to the Sumner Road Road Corridor and the So we've, we've had a briefing, so I presume the report that goes to HIG is based on the briefing that we've received in terms of what's going to happen on each of those corridors, and there's no, no, no change. Um, well, the, the only part that's not actually, well, no, there's two little bits that aren't proceeding, and that's the Sumner Road Road Corridor, and that's where we're going to be doing Can, can I sort of kind of interrupt the line of questioning and just say that, you know, from a psychological point of view, the removal of the containers would mean a lot to the people yeah. Yeah. in that area. And um, the second thing is, is that you've got um, this, this cycleway open at the top, or the, the road open for cyclists across the, the summit road. Is there any chance of that being allowed on the other side, going down into, going down into Littleton? <laughs> At any um, point. Well, I mean. I would say two shows. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, that won't be welcomed by certain cyclists in the family. But <laughs> setting aside all personal interests. We are looking at releasing, we're looking at ways that we could progress the work. There is some work happening now in the Littleton end anyway. Yeah. And through that contract, we may be able to extend that contract up further. But it's really the big benching, that's the, um, that is the big work that needs Yeah, but if that's not going to start for a while, it might actually be possible, if the road's clear, um, for cyclists to use it. Oh, come on, they don't mind taking risks. They go on the road, for goodness sake. So I might anyway. two other questions. One is, just while we're on Sumner, just, um, I just wanted to raise the issue of doing things differently in terms of road closures. And I, I know Paul and I have been in the Mayor's office just working through um, that when people, we just put public notices in the press, but obviously the residents that are directly affected, it would be really good to personally give them a copy of the public notice so that they knew how, what was being proposed and they knew what the objections process was. So I just really wanted to ask the Chief Executive what measures we can put in place to ensure that rather than just relying on the event organiser to do it, that we can be really satisfied that the local people that are directly affected are well aware of what the process is and can be involved. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so we were just discussing this yesterday um, and uh, have agreed that we do need to look at that, to look at um, who has responsibility and we think that the council should take on that responsibility uh, and what processes should be in place. So at the moment it is just a, um, a press release um, as opposed to actually people being individually notified. Uh, so we'll come back with a process around that and um, agree that uh, we need to be much more proactive. Great. And um, thank you for that. And then the final question from me was just 
wondering if you had any update around the time frame for delivery of the Metro Sports. Again, I'll have to hand over to Dave. Um, sorry, Dave, another another snap answer required. Have um, we had an update from Sarah on the progress of the Metro Sports facility? In the time frame. Yeah, we, but we haven't had a, um, a program, a, um, a anchor project capital program with a NADAR schedule in February. Um, I know they are doing work on the business case. Um, but again, it's got to go up through that. They've put together um, two working parties, one of them specifically on the business case, and that's got people from council, people from Sarah, people from Treasury, and people from um, the Department of the Prime Minister's Office to right. try and get that so it can go up to Cabinet as soon as possible. So they are working. I know they've had one meeting, I'm sorry, I don't know what the outcome of that meeting was and what progress they made. I will get an update early February when our next meeting is. So, so yeah, just, we'll be notified of the details of the business case once it's been through Cabinet? I hope so, yes. But, well, you'll have to be, because basically it's also going to look at the scope, which you signed off in November or mm. October, whatever you signed off. So the government hasn't signed off the scope either. Um, you've got that initial briefing of the scope yep. that we've had six options. Yep. Um, we consolidated, when I say we council consolidated on a, on a proposal, um, but the Crown hasn't come down on exactly what they see in that space. I just think some regular communication to the community over what's happening in terms of timeframes and process is really important. Um, a few councils have been seeing through the Napunawai hearings, and one of the things that's come through really clearly is that people are really missing those aquatic and recreational facilities in our city, uh, and they're really, you know, running out of patience, and they've been really patient, but, but I think just regular communication about what's happening is just absolutely critical. My understanding is still on track. They're wanting to bring it on track as they had released in that anchor projects bulletin they put out in November, was the last update that I've seen. And I haven't heard any movement, look, and I haven't got a copy with me, but I can bring up a copy, but there's a program in there, and they're still trying to get the opening date as per that program, uh, as far as I know. Yeah, that's great. Jamie. Um, first of all, I'm not a councillor that does this all the time or anything, but um, I don't do it with every report. But thank you so much for this. This is an outstanding chief executive report, in my opinion. The dashboard approach, the stuff that you need to know, H and S. Um, it's a breath of fresh air in local government land. So thank you, Carlene. Um, secondly, and you sit on VBase with me, so you probably know what I'm going to go to here: um, health and safety. Um, really, really love having this in there, but. Um, just a couple of things around this. One that I was a bit confused about was that in December 2014, we had one lost time injury, yet we've got 41 days lost. I'm a little bit unsure how that connects. And then also we've got one serious harm incident in November. And I want to know, can we as be made aware of that? If there's a serious harm uh, notification going through to WorkSafe, I think that's something that we've got to know about. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And actually, uh, the next report will actually have some of the themes so you can understand what a serious injury is and what the first aid ones are. And I can understand that maybe in PX uh, because it could be privacy issues and sure. that sort of stuff. So uh, maybe even the CE and Employment I mean, Matters Committee could be a place to drill into more of the health and safety right. as a suggestion. And just with that then, if that's coming, uh, I'd just be interested in one, having um, uh, a longer time frame of TRIFA, like the total recorded incident frequency rate, mm -hmm. more than two months just so you can see those patterns, at least sort of 12 months would be ideal. And also lead indicators, like we've got the near misses and that's really it, so you know, unsafe acts or um, mm -hmm. uh, safety ideas, those sort of things. Yeah. And yeah, so that could be for the Employment Matters yeah. Committee though. Yeah, no, um, absolutely um, want to in improve the way that that's presented and also the mitigating yeah. things so that you you understand what it's actually happening. Uh, so the other thing is that we're starting making sure that we are looking at these in the, in the longer term to see what trends there are. Yep. Um, and the same with things like the exit surveys, so that we right. actually get an understanding of where we should focus on that energies. Are we a member, or is there an equivalent of like the New Zealand Business Leaders Health and Safety Forum? So you've got you know chief executives from around the country. I think it was opened by the PM in 2010 or something like that. Um, is local government a member of that, or is there a local government equivalent? I have no idea. I'd have to ask. Uh, Jimmy, Phil, then Ali. Mm, two questions. <coughs> First one on, <coughs> sorry, on page 66, the workforce turnover mm -hmm. regarding to the numbers leaving and numbers the appoint, 
Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, what's the uh, relationship between the, these two, the, you know, category, especially kind of, uh, you know, um, what's the rationale? If we review the, the hiring employee, the OPOP operational group, we can see the overall number is uh, 36, mm -hmm. but in the living mm -hmm. is uh, uh, 19. So I'm not sure that our recruit the new employees depends on our living or we have an overall the kind of manpower or human resource development scheme, you know. Uh, this is skilled person, no matter what kind of person living, etc. So, I so just you, want to know. Yeah, yeah you'll see um, a number of those, are, um, the, those 36 are on part-time or fixed term. So some of those will be seasonal workers, such as lifeguards or... Um, Recreation, or you know, um, so so they won't necessarily match with those people leaving, as opposed to those being appointed. Um, so we can actually break that down, and we do get reports on those. Um, but just uh, to recognise that it's not necessarily a one-for-one -one replacement. Can question is uh, even the the director of infrastructure, <coughs> the Dave, that he mentioned earlier regarding to the ANCO project will be presented to the council in early February. But I'm still concerned uh, because why the, uh, I think a uh, big uh, kind of CEO, uh, the uh, regular report, even uh, have no further the kind of progress, at least have the more or less the kind of the progress. So I still think, you know, we should have listened to this kind of update status from the CEO, for instance, like uh, I remember the new uh, the home bid uh, service and the library facility, you know, where staff were presented to the community board in December and further to the committee and the formal council. But up to now, I didn't have any update status regarding to this facility. Also, some other anchor projects still no any further progress. So whether we can set up this kind of, you know, in the regular the, the, yes. the, the, the report. So, so there was a regular, we did include that in the previous uh, CEO reports and there was an agreement before um, Christmas that um, the director um, of Rebuild um, would uh, provide a separate report um, on a regular basis to the infrastructure committee. Um, and so that's where that is. So um, it may be that uh, what we do is actually make sure that goes out to all councillors. No, but no, it's, it, it's, it's a good point, and I, I think I mean it, it, it seemed appropriate to take it out of the chief executive's report because this is more a, a chief executive's report. But to have a regular update on where the um, projects are uh, tracking, and when you say anchor projects, I know you mean Hornby and <laughs> Riggerton, and I know I'm only teasing you. <laughs> I know what a strong advocate you are for your community. <laughs> I was being complimentary. <laughs> okay, so we'll sort that out. Um, Phil, Ali, then Glenn. Yeah, thanks for your report. I agree with what Jamie has said about that your report. And Colleen, and the um, like the people and culture committee. That's a very positive part, and I can vouch for that being on that committee. I wanted to ask you about the people part, under especially in relation to the exit survey. And clearly, the, um, the response rate, as you indicate, was low. And so, my question really is, what steps are we as a council taking to make sure we get better information? Mm. Yes. Um, so we'd like to use that information. It's a good uh, chance for people to be free and frank. Um, about the good things and the things that uh, we could improve on. Um, so what we'd like to do is that when we, when we receive a resignation is to schedule in uh, an exit interview um, uh, so that we can actually gather that information um, as part of the, uh, somebody leaving an organisation. So it's just an ordinary part of that process. So previously, though, like the, the numbers interviewed say has been low. Mm. So are we taking steps to actually increase, you know, find yeah. out how we're Yes, by um, almost, I won't say mandating it, but, but just making it part, part of somebody that you're leaving. Um, so it's, it's obviously voluntary. Um, so um, uh, people don't need to follow up. But so we, we make it a part of um, 
the normal process, uh, like you know, signing out your cards and those sorts of things. We make it part of that uh, process as well. I so think we're in expectation. Yeah, I think historically the um, the follow up has been you know potentially after the person's already left. Mm. So if you schedule an exit interview at the time that the um, that the resignation is received, then you actually um, it, it will happen more often than not. So I think the numbers are going to increase. So I'm glad we've got a baseline here. I think that's as low as it will go. I hope. I hope. Mm. <laughs> yeah. um, Ali, then Glenn. Thank you. Just looking at community engagement under customer service, um, I wanted to know whether you have stats and information related to other ways that people get in touch via email or by Twitter. I've been using Twitter a lot, particularly at the weekend, and find that it's fantastic because the response is immediate, whereas with an email you're advised that we will be in touch, I believe, between five and ten days. So, uh, and also that Twitter needs to follow up to say that the job has been done or why the job can't be done. Um, and I also, around that, wanted to ask about delivery of service around maintenance as well and how we can find out where we're at with increasing questions and concerns around uh, weed growth and so forth around the city that um, doesn't appear to be being addressed. However, when I tweet an RFS around a specific area, it is dealt with pretty much immediately, which raises the question, is it on a circuit, is it on a, um, um, a list of to-do or not? Mm -hmm. And if not, why not? And how often? And have we changed that level of service? Could we find that out? Uh, sorry, that was rather garbled. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, Jane can respond to that one. Um, in response to the um, the issue about monitoring, um, you know, all the feedback that we get, complaints and so forth. Um, I'm not aware that we collate that, but I think it's something that we should do. Um, and certainly, my understanding is that um, uh, people in the uh, call centre do monitor Twitter. Uh, and social media Very um, well sites too, here. But you also mentioned that you'd like to make sure there was a feedback when something was uh, achieved or responded to. Absolutely, otherwise you kind of forget and then a job isn't done or whatever. Yeah. And also there's a huge sense of satisfaction and, and I hate the word, but closure when a job is, is filed and it's actually done. Yeah. yeah, so I will ask Jane to respond to the I'm maintenance. The process of picking up the question about the, the weed control, so I'm in the process of preparing an answer which I'll circulate to everybody in the next five days or That's six months. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. It might be useful to start thinking about whether that should be more public than just a feedback mm -hmm. to councillors, because mm -hmm. I think a number of us have had several complaints about the quantity, and I know that with the cracks in the footpaths and things like that, that the weeds get through, and I know that there's been a lot of spraying going on, and that takes a wee while to take effect, but um, it is an important issue. The, you know, We've got the eyes of the world on us um, in a couple of weeks' time, so we do want this place looking good. I mean, not that we don't want it looking good all the time, but <laughs> as, as good as possible all the time. Um, Glenn. Thank you, and thank you for your report, Carleen, and uh, obviously very full report, very busy over the Christmas New Year time. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Anne and her team for their responsiveness. Thank you over the last week in relation to various activities, and I think that responsiveness and um, helping to take the heat out of it, which I think was actually unhelpfully amped up in some quarters. I won't say anything more about that. But um, my question is about the, the CapEx underspender. I know you've uh, you've said before, perhaps you've equated that as, as, you know, it could lead to possible underperformance. I have a view also that it's not possible to actually spend all that in a given financial year. And, and I think this has a direct link unless I'm wrong, to the debt-to-revenue ratio. So my question is to you, Peter, how often can we have the debt-to-revenue ratio updates, or do we have them quarterly already in the financial performance reports, or could it be monthly? How often? Yes, we do provide them quarterly. And uh, what's important at the moment is more the projections of where that's going than the current performance. We're well under any particular metric now, uh, and we agree it as part of the... Uh, the Treasury policy and the financing policy as part of the long-term plan, so we get to set the ceiling at that level, uh, but we'll certainly continue reporting that a, on a quarterly basis. All right, that's good. Would someone like to move that the report be received? Uh, Paul Lonsdale, seconded Jamie Goff. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. 
Those opposed say no, that's carried.